Unfortunately, Rosie couldn't be here tonight. Many of you may have seen her on television over the weekend. She was in the hunt at the uh, U.S. Senior Women's Open Championship in uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, and I was told this evening that she only travels by Winnebago and didn't feel that uh, time permitted her to get her Winnebago from Fairfield to Sandusky, Ohio. Um, that's her story, and she's sticking with it. <laughs> Rosie's uh, uh, biography is, is in the uh, pamphlet on your tables this evening. She is truly uh, of Ohio and one of the great players to come out of here. A tremendous career at Ohio State. Played the LPGA from 1982 to 2006. Won 13 times. Was a ferocious uh, Solheim Cup player. Megan Beth will uh, testify to that, uh, I'm pretty sure. She is uh, adding this Hall of Fame membership to her Ohio State Athletics Hall of Fame, uh, as well as the Georgia Golf Hall of Fame. Uh, this plaque this evening will uh, eventually find its way into her Winnebago. And let's, uh, <laughs> let's give her a round of applause. Well deserved. Um, before we continue, uh, we have a special message uh, from the new uh, CEO of the U.S. Hi, guys. It's Mike Wan from the United States Golf Association and the LPGA 12 years before that. And there's really a lot of reasons why I wanted to send this video in, but I'll give you four key reasons. Number one is Ohio. That's where I uh, consider home. It's where I went to school, met my wife, had our first child. Ohio is home for the Wands. But the other three reasons are probably sitting at your head table tonight. Stu and Meg, and Rosie. Three people that have actually positively impacted my life. Uh, Rosie and Meg, the LPGA wouldn't be the LPGA without the two of you, and I would not have been the commissioner without the, without the tour you created. You didn't just play golf, you didn't just love golf, but you left women's golf in a better place than you found it. And Stu, from a crazy conversation we had in, uh, I guess it was November of 2020, to sitting at the USGA headquarters, thank you for what you've meant to, uh, to my career and to my family. And most importantly, thank you to what you've meant to this game. You know, it's no surprise that all three of you are Ohioans. I love you all. I'm proud of you all. And as you walk into the Ohio Golf Hall of Fame, just know that the USGA, the LPGA, and Mike Wan and family couldn't be prouder not only call you golfers, but call you friends. Congratulations to all three of you. Stu Francis knows this. Uh, Mike Wan is a, a very good friend of mine. And uh, the USGA chose exceptionally well when they named him the uh, new CEO. At this time, I'd like to uh, introduce Fred Muller, who will uh, introduce uh, Meg Mallon. Fred is a graduate of Georgia State University. He was the head golf professional at Crystal Downs Country Club from 1977 to 2018. For about 40 years as a PGA of America professional, he competed on the United States PGA Tour, the Australasian Tour, the South American Tour. In 1981, he won the Michigan Open at Grand Traverse Resort. He has a passionate interest in uh, golf course architecture and is an authority on the design, style, and philosophy of the legendary golf architect, Dr. Alistair McKenzie, who laid out Crystal Downs during the late 1920s in collaboration with Perry Maxwell. He is now a design associate with DeVry Designs. Fred's passion for golf, broad range of experience over more than 55 years in the game, and his respected knowledge, well-respected knowledge of golf course design and operations has proven to be a, a wonderful asset to DeVry and to their customers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Fred Muller. In 2019, I traveled with Meg and Beth Daniel uh, to Scotland to Glen Eagles for the Solheim Cup. I mean, it was traveling with golf royalty. People were genuflexing, players and spectators alike, were genuflexing and bowing and carrying on. It was something, except for one guy. This a guy approached us. We were on the edge of a crowd of maybe 3,000 people. The fellow approached us. He had on an Arkansas sweatshirt. Ten teeth, 
maybe nine. And he said he was there to watch Stacy Lewis play golf because she went to Arkansas. Unfortunately, Stacy Lewis had hurt her back. She didn't play that week. And then he said that he, talking very close to us, he said he was standing as close as he's standing to us to Nancy Lopez, but he said, now, don't get me wrong, I wasn't talking to her like I'm talking to you, but I did not get her autograph. He said, can you believe that? Just as he was saying that, a woman came up to Meg and said, oh my goodness, could I thank you for all the wonderful moments you've given me in the Soul I'm Cup over the years? And in golf in general, the guy looked at me and said, who is that? I said, pal, you're talking to a couple Hall of Famers here. He said, well, I, just about then another person comes up and said, oh, Meg Mallon and Beth Daniel. The guy says, oh, my God. He kind of melded into the crowd. What do you think Meg's reaction to that was? He felt, she felt bad that he was not able to watch Stacy Lewis play golf. <laughs> Me, I'm still laughing at the guy. <laughs> this would never happen to a fellow from Ohio, I wouldn't think. I'm a Michigan guy. Uh, don't prejudge me. My favorite team is Michigan State. My second most favorite team is whoever is playing Michigan. <laughs> we lost, we lost the greatest golfer Michigan has ever seen when Meg started crying when they dot the I. <laughs> Who cries when they dot the I? <laughs> you know, I thought the response in Sandusky would be a little different than the response in Frankfurt, Michigan. <laughs> well, Meg's a terrific athlete. When she was growing up, she was a very competitive tennis player, a wonderful swimmer, and a brilliant, brilliant basketball player. If she had had one more inch of vertical, she might have played basketball for Ohio State instead of golf. And then who knows? I mean, who knows? What we do know is this, that Meg won 18 times on the LPGA Tour. Four of those wins were majors. Two of those majors were U.S. Open. Meg, Meg was an eight-time participant on Solheim Cup teams and the two, 2013 Solheim Cup captain for the U.S. side. In 2017, in New York City, they put Meg into the World Golf Hall of Fame. <laughs> These are great accomplishments and wonderful honors but they are not what sets Meg apart. She loves the traditions and history of our game, and golf will long remember the nicest person who has ever hit a golf ball. Meg, we love you so much. You're so, so special. to make speeches, but I know how to pick people who can make speeches, for sure. Can I get an OH? Oh. Hey, there we go. That's my crowd. I knew there were more than that. Thank you, Fred. And as always, lovely, kind, and insightful words. Uh, I first met Fred at Crystal Downs, from the, and from the very beginning, he has been so welcoming and generous to me and my family. You know, golf has brought me so many wonderful friendships. Fred, you and your wife Kay are at the top of the list. Um, I'd like to congratulate my fellow inductees, Stu Francis and Rosie Jones. Unfortunately, Rosie can't be here today. As Stu knows, when you become a USGA champion, you become a part of the USGA family for life, right? So that means we're related. <laughs> here we go, brother. That's it. Um, and Rosie and I have been bonded for a very long time. When I visited Ohio State as a recruit, and Kathy Cook knows this, Rosie was finishing her final semester there. She was um, 
trying to finish 19 credits to get her degree her senior year and playing a full schedule of tournament golf. Um, it, it made such a huge impression on me when, when I saw her doing that. And Rosie and I had become good friends on tour, and we were even partners in the Solheim Cup together. I've learned a lot from Rosie, and I'm forever grateful to her. I'm sorry she couldn't be here today. She really did want to be here. Um, so I, I, hope we get to, I hope we get to show her that. Um, so you guys, this is quite an honor. I'm a kid from Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am in Ohio, and, and thank you to the Ohio Golf Asso Association for doing this. Um, when I first came to Ohio State, I was a walk-on because there were six other freshmen on the team already. And <laughs> my freshman orientation gave me a real taste of what I was in for. As I st stood up during the introduction, they had freshman orientation, they have all the athletes come there, you, you stand up and... They said, Meg Mallon, golf, from Birmingham, Michigan. I get resoundingly booed. <laughs> Boo! Boo! <laughs> I sunk down in my chair and I thought, what have I done? <laughs> so thankfully, I stayed till my senior year and I had earned a, first, a full scholarship. Um, <clears throat> my years at Ohio State taught me so much and prepared me for my next step into professional golf. Um, I am now, as Fred says, the biggest Ohio State fan you'll find out there. I do, I cry every time the band comes out in that field. So, so I went from hating Woody Hayes to crying when the band comes on the field. So that's a pretty good turnaround. I have a, uh, my family's here tonight, but my sister went to Michigan. I had two sisters that graduated from Michigan and they were very gracious in allowing me to, to go to Ohio State. <laughs> um, but I have so many wonderful memories here uh, of my golf memories here in Ohio. My first came when I won the Michigan Amateur in 1983. I was invited to play in the amateur at the Jamie Farr Toledo Classic. Cheryl Stacy was the other amateur and was also my teammate, teammate at Ohio State. We had the great honor of playing with Joanne Carner in our practice round that week. It was awesome. Um, I, I do want to say a special thank you to Judd Silverman, the tournament director. I'm sure a lot of you know Judd who made that happen for both of us. Um, after all these years, Judd is still running a great event there in Toledo. And Toledo will always hold a special place in my heart because it was my first professional tournament, my last professional win, and my last professional event on the LPGA Tour. So that, that was a special time for me. Um, I'll also finally remember uh, I won at the Country Club of the North in Dayton, Ohio. I beat Dottie Pepper in a playoff which was always fun. Dottie and I were rivals, and, you know, when you beat your rival, that's always a fun thing to do. So, um, and then, but I have to say my greatest memory in Ohio will be playing at Muirfield Village, representing my country in the Solheim Cup. That was just amazing. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank Steve Groves, who some of you know, in golf, who was my coach at Ohio State, he saw something in me to ask me to walk on. And I also have to thank my parents because they had to pay out-of-state tuition for their sixth kid. <laughs> so they deserve a lot of credit for that decision as well. My parents are no longer with us, but they were great supporters who let me pursue my dream of being a professional athlete. My family is here supporting me as they have every step of the way. My two brothers and my two sisters are here, and um, they, I, I've just had a wonderfully blessed life and career, and I have my family and friends to thank for all of that. Um, again, thank you to the Ohio Golf Association for doing this, and um, again, it's just a wonderful honor. Thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> Uh, 
And now it's my pleasure to introduce or attempt to introduce a man who needs no introduction in these precincts. Uh, Bob Fairchild is a 2015 inductee into the Ohio Golf Hall of Fame. His father introduced him to the game when he was 12, and in Bob's own words, he was really hooked. He played on the Miami-Dade Community College National Junior College Championship team uh, many years ago, and one of his teammates was Bruce Fleischer, the 1968 U.S. Amateur Champion and a future winner on both the PGA Tour and the Champions Tour. Bob has been a 43-year member of uh, Canterbury, where he's won only 16 <coughs> club championships. Um, qualified for the U.S. Amateur six times, the U.S. Mid Amateur five times, he won the 1993 Ohio Amateur Championship, and he won the Northeast Ohio Amateur Championship in 1993, 1997, and 1998. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Fairchild. <laughs> At 43 years at Canterbury, he's now 51, so that, uh, that, that dated that information. <laughs> Hard to believe. Um, Rosie and Meg, I'd like to congratulate you on your induction, and uh, it's a, sure, certainly a pleasure to welcome Stu and Diana back to the great state of Ohio, uh, his home state, and it's my pleasure to introduce him this evening. Uh, Stu being from Madison, we played a lot of golf together when we were juniors, and uh, we played some home-and-home -home matches. I always lived on the west side of Cleveland, he way east, uh, but Brian Duffin was one that played with us, and Bob Smith out at, at Lakewood Country Club, and uh, so we just figured a little bit earlier at the cocktail reception that Stu and I have been friends for about 55 years. Hard to believe when I'm only 59. <laughs> We can all relate to uh, spending a day on the golf course with someone, you really learn about their character. In Stu's case, you learn about his character in about the first 10 minutes after you meet him. Uh, his, his honesty, high character and morals, intellect, care for others, and now looking back, loyalty to your longtime friends. Being the president of the United States Golf Association, I just look through uh, the website today, there's some rather notable folks that have been past presidents of the USGA. George Walker, Walker Cup fame. Uh, William Foams from uh, Oakmont. Prescott Bush. Richard Tufts of the Pinehurst family, uh, or the founder of Pinehurst. Hord Harden, Sandy Tatum, Bill Campbell, a a fellow Princeton grad, Fred Ridley, and now Stu Francis since 2020. We certainly owe you a debt of gratitude for your commitment of time, talent, and treasury to the USGA, Stu, um, and being on the executive committee for, I think, seven or eight years, and, and now as president. Um, I just asked him today how many days he commits to the USGA. He says 60 days a year traveling and about 40 Zoom calls. So we should all be appreciative and grateful for your service to the game that's been such a large part of all of our lives. So thank you for that, Stu. I also, I want to go a little bit off script here. I just want this gentleman to stick his hand up, Tristan Lewis. Tristan, my great friend, a lot of us are uh, sporting uh, Bob Jones Award pins. Bob Jones Award uh, was established in 1955, and it's the USGA's highest honor. And past winners include Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, Mickey Wright, Nancy Lopez, George H.W. Bush, Siri Pack, and in 2021, Bob Lewis. Normally, this award is presented at the U.S. Open. But um, this year, the original plan was to give Bob Lewis the Bob Jones Award at the Walker Cup at Seminole. And it became very apparent that Bob would not be able to travel and further was nearing the end of his life. And I called my friend Stu Francis to tell him that. And he said, I will bring the Bob Jones Award to Cleveland, Ohio, to Bob Lewis's house. 
So, thank you for that. Story. That, 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 was a, that was a wonderful undertaking, and the Lewis family and the few friends that were there, Randy Reifers and myself and Jim Holtgrieve, will never forget what you did for the Lewis family and uh, the friends of Bob Lewis. Stuart, I'm very proud to call you a friend, and I'm very proud to present you for the Ohio Golf Hall of Fame. Well, good evening. As Bob said, we have been friends for 55 years. We've competed against each other frequently on the golf course. And I always remembered I needed to bring my A game when I was playing against Bob Fairchild. I didn't realize I needed to bring my A game when I was speaking after Bob Fairchild. <laughs> but I certainly had to do that. There's no question, Bob, that you're a great friend. You're a very articulate man and a wonderful spokesman for the game of golf. First, as I start, I would like to start out and thank my wife, Diana, a fellow Ohioan, born in Columbus, went to Miami. And what I've so appreciated about the 43 years we've been married and the extent of uh, effort and love I put into the game of golf, she really understands how important amateur golf and competitive golf is to me. So thank you. <laughs> Next, I, I would like to thank the Ohio Golf Association, Matt Lefferts. I mean, they do a great job of running championships. He's so responsive. I, I texted him last week with a kind of a mundane question about this evening, and he gets back to me in three minutes, and he said, sorry it took me so long. We're teeing people off in the Ohio Amateur, so I'm kind of busy today. <laughs> but it was pretty, pretty impressive. I'd also like to congratulate Rosie and Meg. What an honor to be uh, inducted into the Ohio Golf Hall of Fame with you. Your accomplishments have been extraordinary, and the respect you have in the game is amazing. So well done. Um, you know, the Hall of Fame has some very impressive people in it. I looked through the list and uh, sort of pinched myself a few times. You know, Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, a whole host of people. And all of us here have many stories about golf, but it was interesting. I had three or four that I thought about as I looked through the list. So with Jack Nicklaus, I, I had to meet with Jack uh, in early May in Florida during the Walker Cup. i talk about a couple of USGA things. So I went into his office, and he's there in shorts, very casual. Stu, how are you? Nice to see you. He said, well, congratulations on being selected to the Ohio Golf Hall of Fame. I'm in that, too. And I said, well, I kind of... <laughs> I said, I, I, I do kind of get that. <laughs> and I said, you know, it's such an honor for me. And I said, look, one of the, the biggest disappointments in my life is that I was so close several times to winning the Ohio State Amateur, but I never won it. And I've just been disappointed about it ever since. And he said, Stu, get over it. I didn't win it either. <laughs> Uh, another one of the uh, inductees into the Ohio Hall Golf Hall of Fame is Arnold Palmer. And I'm sure everyone has an Arnold Palmer story. I was fortunate enough to play with Arnold twice. And once we played in Sun Valley, it was sort of a little business thing. And we, had a, we were having a great time. And about the, I was playing pretty well. But the 12th or 13th hole, Arnold says, you know, your game's pretty on. He said, do you have any tournaments coming up. And I said, well, actually, I do have a tournament next week. The Crump Cup is one of my favorite championships. I play in every year. Great field, great friends. He said, I've heard all about it. Good luck. I think you're going to do well. A friend of mine from my club, Jim Bryan, is playing in the Crump Cup for his first time. So please look him up when you're there. So we're in the bar having a drink, and I'm talking to somebody, and I hear someone behind me say, I'm Jim Bryan. So I turned around and I said, geez, did I just hear you say you were Jim Bryan? And he said, yes. And I said, well, my name's Stu Francis. And before I could say, I'm trying to look you up, he said, I've been looking for you. Arnold told me to look you up. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that Arnold Palmer? Yeah. <laughs> and the last famous one I'll tell from the inductees list, just I'm so proud to be part of it, is Byron Nelson. Uh, I did play with Byron a number of times. 
he came to Geneva, Ohio for true temper. He was the Iron Byron swing machine. So he'd come every summer to our next door neighbors. So we played one day and uh, I, I played really well. I think I shot 67 at Madison. And, and Byron says, geez, you're playing great. You have anything coming up? And I said, well, yeah, the Ohio Amateur next week is up at Belmont Hills in Toledo. He said, geez, I'm gonna be up there. I'm gonna be at Inverness. I'll come over and say hello. So we're warming up on the range. It's the day before the tournament starts. And now all of a sudden I hear everyone get kind of quiet and everything. And Byron Nelson's here. And he sort of looks over at me and looks about that far away and says, Stu, there you are. If you play as well this week as you played with me last week, these guys don't have a chance. <laughs> so, so, you know, competitive golf also generates com a lot of goodwill. Uh, now, just I'll have a very short talk. I want to talk first about what golf has really meant to me and probably to many of the people here. And second, I'll share a few fun and meaningful stories about being the president of the USGA, which, uh, you know, we all have a common background. I think every one of you could be standing here and probably doing a better job than I'm doing with the USGA, but I'm doing my best, and it's great. But I would say, as you think about your own experience in golf and what it's meant, and certainly for me in competitive golf, what it's meant, it's just been so many things. Family bonding. I mean, our family played every Sunday, my brother and I, my father and my mother, and we just loved it. They trundled me around to a variety of tournaments at a very early age. You learn how to interact with adults in golf. You really learn how to control your emotions in golf. Our, it's interesting, our younger daughter caddied at a local club, and she'd caddy for sort of the same guy every week. And this fellow would just say, now look, Emily, let me explain to you how you interact with adults and how you interact with men so you can really get somewhere. And they were very meaningful things that she learned. And that's the beauty of golf is you can have an unadulterated conversation with someone because there's a higher power there, which is how much each of you care about golf. Clearly, uh, it, it helped me, and, and Dick George is, takes the great credit. It was I was a recruited college athlete at Princeton, and golf helped me really get in, for one thing, and I just had a wonderful time playing intercollegiate athletics in a couple sports, actually. Um, you get so many lifelong friends in golf. Probably, as you all think about this room and look around, you've known each other for a long time. You can remember so many stories that you did with each other. And it's so unique about golf. And, and most of my long-term friends are people I met in golf. Most of my current friends are people that I play golf with. So it's lovely. The other thing I would say about competitive amateur golf is you really understand what everyone grapples with as you go through your age careers in golf, where you have a career, you have a family, you might even have grandchildren. But there are many things to balance. And people really make the effort to keep their game sharp as well as keep the rest of their life sharp. And you have to respect people for doing that. Um, so I think if you sort of put a summary on it, golf really is such a meaningful sport to be part of. And, and I, for one, am tremendously appreciative. People comment about how extensive the time is that you have to be involved with the USGA. My answer back to that is for what golf has given me, that amount of time is a drop in the bucket uh, to pay it back. <laughs> now, let me just share just a couple short stories on some of the cool things that, that you do get to do in this role. Uh, the first thing is, is somebody, I, I went home one after, you know, a couple long meetings in the USGA, and Diana said, how was it? And I said, well, actually, it was pretty good. I got to hang around with golfers. I was at a championship for the national title. I heard about tons of golf stories. I didn't have to post a score. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty good. But um, we've had some really amazing time frames here over the last few years in golf overall and the USGA. And, you know, we had so many quick decisions we had to make around COVID, both, you know, we went from 14 championships to four. We uh, didn't do the Walker Cup or the Curtis Cup. And we, we really had a host of things to deal with. And, and Bob Kane remembers this well. He and I went on the executive committee at the same time. And 
just the things that come up that you have to deal with and you think everything's fine and then all of a sudden an issue comes up and you just have to deal with it. And when you're leading the game, you have to deal with it in a thoughtful manner. So, Bob, your legacy of making decisions is uh, still in place. But, you know, we had to cut the championships back from 14 to 4. Shortly after that, we had the opportunity to transition transition back to NBC and NBC Golf Channel from Fox, which we were happy with. Um, and I think, what I would say this, look, Fox did a nice job, but NBC has the golf audience that we care about. And, you know, it's just, it, it was one of those things, and we had to, to make a quick decision. One of the tough parts is I, I, was, I was hoping to shoot my age last year, and um, I was out on the golf course, and I was on the 17th hole, I was three under par, I had a perfect drive, and the par is 71, so I'm looking at a 68, that's what I was. And you're not allowed to use cell phones at San Francisco Golf Club, but my phone buzzed. And I had to pick it up because it was Mike Davis saying, we need to make the final decision in the next 10 minutes if we're gonna sign this NBC deal. And I said, do it, let's go ahead. And then I yanked it in the bunker, made bogey. <laughs> But I did shoot my edge two weeks later. But I was, but anyway, so, you know, very quick decision, you know, significant dollars at stake, et cetera. I think Bob Kane was part of this. We've really made a conscious effort to have the future open sites lineup really be the traditional high visibility grand golf courses of the U.S. And we're not going to do much experimentation going forward. <laughs> And, and the other thing I'd say, you obviously saw the U.S. Women's Open uh, at Olympic this year, and there's more to come on things like that. The Women's Open, as we announced some of the sites we hope will lock down shortly, it's just going to be extraordinary. And it's uh, due to you and others that we're doing that, so that's great. Um, you know, we had the CEO transition to Mike Wan from Mike Davis, and that was, you know, very interesting. Mike had told us a couple years ago that he was going to step down, and uh, the thing I remember most about Mike Wan is we sat down and we said, okay, who do we want to go after? And someone said, I said, how about Mike Wan? To the committee, and the committee said, ah, I just signed a 10-year deal. And I said, well, so? <laughs> and, uh, you know, three months later, we uh, lined up Mike as our CEO. Um, I think Bob mentioned something very meaningful to me, awarding the Bob Jones Award to Bob Lewis with Tristan and your family was truly a one-of-a-kind experience, and Bob Fairchild and Ellen and everybody uh, really helped make that happen, but it was lovely, truly lovely. And I think if part of it, same thing, you call the Walker Cup uh, players and the Curtis Cup players, that's one of the things the president gets to do is you get them on the phone and, you know, they're waiting to hear from you, and it's just, there's such lovely conversations because you say, look, I'm calling to let you know that the USGA has selected you to represent the United States in the Walker Cup or the Curtis Cup, and the amount of emotion that comes back to you from people who put their lives into achieving something like that is truly extraordinary. The only buzzkill part of it is a number of the Curtis Cup players, you have this unbelievably, you know, inspiring conversation but then because they're 18, you have to say, well, can I speak to your mother or father, please? <laughs> and it's kind of, it sort of is a buzzkill for them. <laughs> but, it's, but it's really great. You know, we get to go through some interesting things, some interesting rulings, uh, some interesting decisions about how we lead the game. But overall, from a, from a you know, local guy, a small town kid from small town Madison, Ohio, to be standing here at this podium talking to a bunch of great friends about what it's like to be you know, a leader of the USGA and more importantly, to celebrate being in the Hall of Fame. Thank you all very much. Stu, Meg, congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this evening. And that will be a wrap on this evening's Ohio Golf Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Thank you very much. Thank you.